الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد. So we had been talking about the actual uh, journey of the Hijra. And uh, we had mentioned the story, the, the, the miraculous, the amazing story of Suraqa ibn Malik, which is one of those stories that is really an iman lift, an iman boosting story, how this Bedouin from the Banu Mudlaj is told that he's going to be wearing the, uh, the uh, bracelets of Kisra, the bracelets of the emperor of Persia, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, the story of the Hijra has a number of small stories. And one of the significant ones is the story of Umm Ma'bad, small still paragraph about the story of Umm Ma'bad. And the story of Umm Ma'bad is narrated from her directly. Uh, and uh, she converted to Islam uh, at the end. Umm Ma'bad narrates the story herself and she says that she is an elderly lady uh, and she is a complete like Bedouin. She is living in the desert in a tent, wandering from place to place, finding food and, uh, and water. So her husband had left to find some food and she's in her uh, sheepskin or goat tent. She's in the tent waiting for her husband to return and she hears the rustling outside of some travelers who ask permission to come in. And she comes in, she's not, she asks them to come in because she's not worried about anything. She's an elderly lady and she has nothing to be stolen. She's very uh, poor. And it turns out it's Abu Bakr and, and the Prophet system, but she doesn't recognize them because she doesn't know who they are. And she describes the, the, what's significant. Umm Ma'bad is one of the few uh, sahabiyat who describes the physical looks of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of the Sahaba did not describe him in that detail. Umm Ma'bad is one of those who describes him as being Wasim, for example, handsome and he had long hair and he was neither short nor tall. So she gives that description that I've already mentioned in the beginning. I mentioned Umm Ma'bad's description right when we began the seerah. I mentioned that description from Umm Ma'bad. So, uh, uh, and this was, by the way, outside of Medina by an hour and a half drive in our time. It's still, in our time, this place is still called the same as it was called then, and it's called Qadid. Qadid, when you're driving from Mecca to Medina or Jeddah to Medina, you will pass by a sign that says Qadid, exit. And that's where this incident uh, took place. So the Prophet ﷺ entered in and Abu Bakr and they said, uh, may we purchase any food from you? We, we are travelers and we would like some food to purchase. Um, and this is of course the adab of Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't ask for free food. Even though if they had asked for free food, this is also customarily acceptable. When Bedou and when travelers are going, they just want some water or some basic bread. Whatever you have, can you ha share? But they asked food to be purchased. And Umm Ma'bad replied that she apologized. She has absolutely nothing to give them. Nothing at all uh, because her husband is, has actually gone out in search of uh, food. Uh, they asked for, um, do you have any milk, anything? She said, we have absolutely nothing to give. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ saw in the tent an old goat in the corner. And it had long, uh, you know, the, the, the heyday of this goat, the, the era of this goat had now been on the decline. It's basically about to be slaughtered. It is no longer giving milk. It is no longer capable of giving birth. It's just an old goat that's basically uh, about to be slaughtered one day when they want to have some type of meat. That's what it's waiting for in the corner. It's not even grazing outside. So the Prophet ﷺ asked permission to uh, milk the goat. Umm Ma'bad smirked and said, that day has long gone. You can't get any milk from this. That's gone. It's like this is now no, no, no more. And so the process and once again said, but do you allow me to? But do you allow me to? And she, of course, I mean, there is no question in her mind, where is the milk going to come out? You can do what you want. The goat is beyond giving milk. And so uh, Umm Ba'ba said, if you, if you want to, go ahead. I mean, if that's what you want to do. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua. And he mentioned the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he moved his hand under the udder and the udder filled up with milk right then and there. The udder filled up with milk and Abu Bakr then milked the, uh, uh, the, the milk from this goat and it brimmed all the way to the top and the Prophet ﷺ drank, uh, Abu Bakr drank and they left the remainder for Umm Ma'bad and her husband. When her husband returned, he's shocked to find the milk because they want milk for many days and they haven't had milk. Where did you get this milk from? From this goat. How did this goat give milk? So she gave the whole story that two strange men came and this is where she described the Prophet ﷺ. She described the Prophet ﷺ in detail. One of them you know, was, was taller and handsome and this and that and the other looked like his companion. She described all of this. Her husband said, those are the two the Quraysh are searching for because the news has spread and uh, those are the two. Do you not know that one of them claims to be a Nabi? One of them claims to be a Nabi. And when she heard this, she realized this is not just a claim, he is a Nabi. 
he is a Nabi, and so both her and her husband accepted uh, Islam. And this is one of those small stories of Umm Ma'bad. It is also narrated, by the way, that two or three other people accepted Islam, but we don't have their stories. That the Prophet passed by them and spoke to them, and they accepted Islam. And in this, even though it's so insignificant, we don't even have the names of some of them, right? But still, the point is, subhanAllah, when he's basically running for his life, right? Even though he knows Allah is going to protect him, but still it is running for his life. He still pauses to give da'wah to people. He's still in inviting people to Islam. And subhanAllah, at least we have references of at least four or five people converting in this journey from Makkah to Medina. Yani subhanAllah, wherever the Prophet is going, he's spreading good. Doesn't, no time no place is, is basically lacking for da'wah. Any opportunity that the Prophet ﷺ gets, he is giving da'wah. Uh, it is also narrated once that a caravan passed them by. A caravan, now of course this is the middle of the desert and caravans are going back and forth, a strange caravan. In those days, if a caravan passed by in the desert, they would make way to meet each other just to, you know, pass news and find out what's happening and say salam or, 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 or get greetings. Can you imagine, you're in the middle of the desert, you haven't seen a human for many days. You see somebody in the desert, you'll simply kind of sort of meander towards each other, talk a little while and then move on, right? So, when a caravan saw the two riders, they veered away to go and say hello or to, say, to give greetings to them and lo and behold one of them recognized Abu Bakr from a trading expedition. This is not the Quraysh, this is not the Ansar. This is a caravan, we don't know which Arab tribe it is but at some fair or at some business transaction Abu Bakr was a trader, they recognized Abu Bakr. And so they greeted Abu Bakr. Now this is a caravan coming from another area. They haven't heard of the bounty. They haven't heard the two people have fled from Mecca, right? So they recognize Abu Bakr and they uh, find out some information, whatever they wanted to. And then they ask Abu Bakr, who is this man with you? Who is this man with you? And Abu Bakr instantaneously responded in what is called Tawriya. Tawriya, as I've said many times, is double meaning. And this is allowed in Islam for a reason. This is not lying. In English, we call it a white lie. It's not a lie. It doesn't give you an untruth. But it's rather a double meaning. And so Abu Bakr said, He is my guide guiding me to the path. He is my guide guiding me to the path. And of course, what Abu Bakr meant was, He is my guide to Surat al-Mustaqim. Guiding me to the path to Jannah. Right? But what they understood was, this is my hired guide that is guiding me. Right? This is the double meaning that Abu Bakr instantaneously uh, uh, said. This also shows us, by the way, that at a certain point in time, the, uh, the guide, Abdullah ibn Urayqit, left them. That finally, when they got to the road that they understood, he went back and returned, and it was just the two of them. Because obviously, when they entered Medina, the guide had, had already left. So the guide basically brought them to a place where from that point onwards they knew how to get to Medina. And so this caravan intercepted them uh, at that point in time and that's when Abu Bakr said, Innahu uh, This is my guide, Yahdini ila tariq, he's guiding me to the tariq, he's guiding me to the Salat al-Mustaqim. And of course Abu Bakr intended one thing and another thing was understood. Now, some uh, lessons from the Hijrah before we move to the city of Medina and its strategic uh, importance. Some lessons from the Hijrah. SubhanAllah, look at the meticulous preparations for the Hijrah. The Prophet is telling Abu Bakr, don't travel. I need a companion and inshallah it will be you. Abu Bakr instantaneously prepares two camels, fattens them up, force feeds them, makes that hump nice and large so that they can travel in the desert. The Prophet then comes to him when everybody is asleep so that nobody can see that the Prophet is, is, is basically planning something. And even when he comes, his face is covered, muqanni'ah. His face is covered, so that just in case, nobody can recognize. But of course, Abu Bakr recognizes because that's his best friend, his, his companion. And when he enters the house, he tells the people, everybody leave. Now all of these preparations are coming from somebody who has ultimate tawakkul in Allah. Correct? Still, he takes precautions. And this manifests the reality of our religion. Tie your camel and then put your trust in Allah. Right? You do everything you can. Look at the secrecy. Look at uh, every single aspect. Uh, leaving Ali in his bed so that when somebody looks in over the window, they find a body over there tossing and turning. Right? So much down to this detail. Leaving Ali in his bed so make sure that nobody gets suspicious. Uh, coming to Abu Bakr first in the middle of the day and then in the middle of the night. When they actually leave for Hijrah, they leave in the dead center of the night. Covering their tracks. Amir ibn Fuhaira coming and covering their tracks. Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr coming every morning telling them the news. 
Finding somebody like Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr whom they can trust and whom the Quraysh would not suspect. Giving some food, asma, giving them every single detail. It is just amazing that they took the best precautions. And yet what is beautiful, when they're out in the desert all open, the Prophet ﷺ is not worried. He's not, he's not grieved. He's not uh, troubled. He's walking, reciting Quran, and not even looking left or right. As we saw when Suraqa came, Suraqa was the one who's noticing from afar. Abu Bakr is worried. Abu Bakr cannot concentrate. Abu Bakr's heart is palpitating, sometimes before, sometimes behind. He's worried. What if I go behind, somebody comes from back? Let me go back, behind. When he comes behind, what if somebody comes to the front? Let me go in front. Back and forth. While the Prophet ﷺ, he's done everything he can. Now, he puts his trust in Allah. Right? This is the essence of tawakkul. That you do everything possible. You don't act like a fool in our religion. This is not tawakkul. You do everything meticulously down to the last planning. But your heart is not attached to these preparations. Your heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, once you've done everything, again in the cave, right? Abu Bakr begins palpitating again, right? Ya Rasulullah, if they just look down, they'll see us. He can't, he's, he's worried. Not for himself, for the Prophet And the Prophet has to calm him down. This is tawakkul. They're hiding in a cave. This doesn't go against tawakkul, right? This is tying the camel. This is taking precautions. They don't stand up and say, here we are, do what you can. Allah is going to protect me. This is not tawakkul. This is tawakkul to hide in the cave so that they don't see it. Allah will then send the pigeon or Allah will then send the spider if these riwayat are authentic and there's nothing wrong with affirming them. Allah will make sure that uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab and Umayyah ibn Khalaf don't look down. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you once you've done your job. And the same applies to each and every element of our lives. That when we want something, we have a goal. Allah has told us the path to the goal. We need to make sure we undertake this path. But our tawakkul is not in the path, it is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's a beautiful verse in Surah At-Tawbah, which is one of the last surahs revealed at a time when the Muslims were at the peak of their power, after the conquest of Mecca, Allah reveals, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ At the peak of Islamic power, Allah Azza wa Jal says to the Sahaba, if you're not going to help the Prophet Wasallam, don't worry, Allah has already helped him. إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا When the uh, Kuffar expelled him from Mecca. Thani athnaini. And he was the second of only two people. There were only two people and an entire city was out to kill them. Thani athnain. Right? There were this, he was the second of only two people. Idhuma fil ghari. When they were in the cave. The cave of Thawr. Idhuma fil ghari. Idh yaqulu li sahibihi la tahzan. When he said to his companion, La tahzan, inna Allah ma'ana. Don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَنزَرَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ At that point, Allah sent His sakina upon the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was not worried. He was not anxious. He was completely calm because Allah had sent His sakina down. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِرُوحِ مِنْ And Allah helped him. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَ And He helped him with an army that you didn't see. A lot of scholars say this army is basically the, the, the dove and the, the pigeon and the, the, the spider. This is the tafsir according to one interpretation. This is the army that Allah Azza wa Jal did not allow the mushrikun to even think that in this crevice there might be Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is amazing that Allah revealed this verse when the Muslims were at their pinnacle and Allah says, this strength is not going to, I don't need this strength. I already helped him when there was none of you. None of you were able to help him. When there were only two, and I sent an army that you could not uh, see. Also, by the way, from this verse, an important point here. The only companion of our Prophet Sallallahu whose companionship has been testified for by Allah is Abu Bakr. The rest is inferred indirectly. It's there, but it's indirect. But for Abu Bakr, it is direct. How so? Allah says, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ Allah affirmed Abu Bakr as being a sahib, a sahabi. Right? The only sahabi who actually Allah mentions, this is his sahabi. So if anybody denies Abu Bakr as being a sahabi, 
He has gone against what Allah has said in the Quran. And again, this is no wishy-washiness here. This is exactly what Allah says. And by unanimous consensus of all the groups of Islam, even they will admit that it was Abu Bakr in the cave and not anybody else. If it's Abu Bakr in this cave and not anybody else. And Allah says, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا So anybody who denies suhbah of Abu Bakr, he has gone against what Allah Azza wa Jal is saying in the uh, Quran. Now, uh, before we get to the arrival of the Prophet in Medina, that will be inshallah next Wednesday. Uh, so right now we're basically right outside the city of Medina and the Prophet is about to come in. Right? So before we get there, that is next week, inshallah ta'ala. I wanted to talk about why Medina? What is, out of all of the cities of the world or of Arabia, or even, even of the world, because there were Muslims in Ethiopia right now, in Habasha, Abyssinia, excuse me, there were Muslims in Abyssinia, right? If Allah had wanted to, He could have told the Prophet and him, look, the king of Abyssinia uh, has already embraced uh, your religion, why don't you go to him? And, uh, you know, he can then become a public Muslim or do something like this. But why did Allah Azza wa choose Medina? So, a little bit about uh, Medina. Medina, of course, is not its original name. Its original name is Yathrib. Its original name is Yathrib. And Yathrib is an ancient city surrounded by volcanic rock. And it is blessed with an undercurrent of water. There is... Um, uh, I don't know the geological term, but there is a river that flows basically underneath. Uh, there's a, an undercurrent of water, not a public river, not an, not an open river, but there's a river that basically from the mountains around it, it comes and there is a, a, a water source underneath the city that allows for this fertile date palms to grow. And that's why Medina is known for its uh, date palms. It has always been famous for its dates. There are two places in the Arabian Peninsula that had such large date palms, Khaybar and Medina, Yathrib. These were the only two places that had these large uh, date palms. And in fact, our Prophet was shown Medina by its date palms. In Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, when he's in Mecca, he said, رَأَيْتُ فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أُهَاجِرُ مِن مَكَّةَ إِلَىٰ أَرْضٍ بِهَا نَخْلٌ فَذَهَبَ وَهْلِ إِلَىٰ أَنَّهَا الْيَمَامَ أَوْ هَجَرْ فَإِذَا هِيَ الْمَدِينَةُ يَثْرِب The Prophet said, this is in the 11th year, 10th or 11th year of the da'wah. Two years before the Hijrah, he tells the Muslims, I saw a dream that I'm going to emigrate to a land. And I saw a lot of date palms. And so I thought that it might be Al-Yamama or Hajr. And these are two cities far away on the other side of the peninsula in Yemen. This is not in the Hijaz. And Yemen does have some date areas. But in the Hijaz, the only places are Yathrib and Khaybar. So I thought it might be the, the Yemen, uh, Yamam al Hajar, but it turned out to be Medina. When did the Prophet find out it turned out to be Medina? When the Khazraj embraced Islam and when they invited him to come. So, subhanAllah, in his own dream, he saw the city, but he couldn't recognize it. He couldn't recognize it until the sign came from the embracing of the Khazraj and then the oath of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Bukhari as well, أُمِرْتُ بِقَرْيَةٍ تَأْكُلُ الْقُرَىٰ يَقُولُونَ يَثْرِبْ وَهِيَ الْمَدِينَةِ I have been commanded to emigrate to a city that shall devour all other cities. تَأْكُلُ الْقُرَىٰ يَقُولُونَ يَثْرِبْ They call it يَثْرِبْ وَهِيَ الْمَدِينَةِ But it is Medina. From this hadith we learn that it is not allowed Islamically to use the name Yathrib anymore. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, they call it Yathrib. This is what mankind has called it. But its name now is going to be Medina. يَقُولُونَ يَثْرِبْ وَهِيَ Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ changed its name from Yathrib to Medina. And it is clear that the Qur'an itself emphasizes this point because the Qur'an mentions Yathrib only from the tongues of the munafiqun. Only from the tongues of the munafiqun. وَإِذْ قَالَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَا يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَرْجِعُ When the munafiqun, when the, in the Quran, when the munafiqun are trying to stoke up fear of the Muslims, they call out to the people and they say, يَا أَهْلَا يَثْرِبَ so the Munafiqun used to call the city still Yathrib because they didn't like the name uh, Medina. And in one hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever says Yathrib should say Astaghfirullah. Whoever calls Medina Yathrib should say Astaghfirullah because it is 
Tabah. Because it is Taba. We're going to get to this name in a while. What is uh, Taba? Now, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal therefore always calls the city Medina. Allah calls it Medina. And the Prophet calls it Medina. So Allah says, for example, in Surah Tawbah, لَإِن لَمْ يَنْتَهَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِنَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَجٌ وَمِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ مِنْ حَوْلِ الْمَدِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal calls the city Medina in Surah At-Tawbah. And it is the Munafiqoon who call it Yathrib. Also our Prophet Sallallahu said they call it Yathrib and it is uh, Medina. So what does Yathrib mean? Yathrib, uh, some scholars say it comes from uh, Tathrib, which means to criticize. Surah Yusuf, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم There is no criticism on you today. And others say it comes from Tharb, which means evil and corruption. And we know that our Prophet did not like bad names. And a number of people converted to Islam with bad names and he changed their names. And he said, no, this is not your name, this is your name. Right? Um, in one hadith, a woman comes and converts, what's your name? Sour. You're not sour, you're sweet. Right, and then similar like this. Uh, so the Arabs had a superstition, and it is still prevalent in our culture of India, Pakistan as well, that they say something bad about somebody else. If somebody say, if somebody says something good, so if somebody says your child is handsome, the mother might say, no, no, he's very ugly. Right, this is common in our culture for those who know. Why they'll say nazar, they'll say evil eye. This is in fact not the Islamic way to counter evil eye. This is what the Arabs would do as well. It's not the, the Jahiliya Arabs. And our Prophet did not like this. We don't, we don't do this. We don't counter evil eye in this manner. But that's a separate topic. I'm not talking about that now. The point being bad names are avoided. So when Yathrib has a bad meaning, the Prophet changed it. And he called it al Madina. And what a beautiful name. al Madina means it's the city. The city, capital T, capital C, Al Madina. And a longer name is Medina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the Prophet primarily called it Al Madina. Now, Al Madina also has many names. In fact, uh, some of the scholars who wrote about the history of Medina, such as the Samahudi and others, uh, have actually listed over a hundred names of Medina. Over a hundred names of Medina. And another scholar who wrote about the history of Islam, early scholar, said, No city has more names than the city of Medina. And the Arabs, when they considered something grand, they would give it many names. And so the city of Medina has the most names of any city known to early Islam. However, our Prophet called it only two or three things. Of them is, of course, Medina. Of them is Taba. Taba is also the name of the city. And Taba and Taiba, both. Taba and Taiba. So Taba and Taiba both mean the same thing. Taba and Taiba mean the pure. And the source of purity, right? So, uh, in one hadith, uh, it's for example the hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, the Prophet said, Whoever says Medina, and this actually shows that Yathrib meant evil and corruption because the opposite of evil is Tayyib and Taba, right? So, don't say Yathrib, say Taba, at Taba, at Taba. Right, and also in another hadith he called it al tayyiba So al tayyiba al taba al Medina. These are all names of the uh, city. Uh, Medina has many, many blessings associated with it. Of them is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made du'a that Medina become beloved to him. In a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Allahumma habib ilayn al Medina taka hubbina Makkah ta aw ashad." Oh Allah, cause us to love Medina as much as we love Makkah, or even more than this. Cause us to love Medina as much as we love Mecca or more than this. And Ibn Abbas narrates that whenever the Prophet would come back from an expedition and he would see the silhouette of Medina in the distance, he would become excited and uh, tell his camel or his horse to go faster. So he became excited to see the city of Medina and he would love the city of uh, Medina. And of course Medina has the mountain of Uhud. And the mountain of Uhud, the Prophet said uh, that Jabal yuhibbuna wa nuhibbuhu. This is a mountain we love it and it loves us. So we believe that the mountain loves the Muslims. The mountain of Uhud is a blessed mountain. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Uhud is one of the mountains of Jannah. And this is uh, in Medina. And our Prophet ﷺ told us that Dajjal will not be able to enter Medina. Dajjal will not be able to enter Medina. He will come to Medina trying to destroy it. But he will not be able to enter it because two large angels will meet him at the door and expel him and kick him out. And so one of the cities that 
uh, Dajjal will never be able to enter is Medina. And therefore, uh, when the, the, in one hadith, basically in the early tradition, we are told that if we hear of Dajjal, we should go to Medina. Because Medina will protect you from the Dajjal. Uh, also, our Prophet ﷺ said that no plague shall ever uh, infest Medina. Right? No plague will ever wipe off the city of Medina. And subhanAllah, in its 14 centuries, famines have come, but no plagues. There have been famines in Medina. Because the Prophet made dua against plague. But there has never been a plague. Even when the, 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 the plagues happened in the past, the bubonic plague, or in 1918 there was the famous Spanish influenza that killed one third of the world. You should know this, 100 years ago, literally one third of the world died in this, in this Spanish influenza, the, the, the second bubonic plague. It didn't touch the city of Medina. The city of Medina was uh, protected, which is amazing because people come to Medina from all over the world. But the plague did not enter uh, Medina. Also, our Prophet ﷺ made dua that Medina be blessed. Medina be blessed. The Prophet ﷺ said that, O oh Allahumma barik lana, O oh Allah, give us baraka in fi Medinatina, in this city of ours. And he said, hadith is in Bukhari, that, O oh Allah, your servant and Abd and Khalil Ibrahim, qad harrama Makkah. He declared Makkah a haram. And I too am your servant. And your Abd and your Rasul, so I make dua to you to make Medina a haram. To make Medina a haram. And so Medina is considered the second Thani al Haramain, the second haram in our religion. And in one hadith, also in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, Oh Allah, bless us in our weights and our measurements of Medina. What is the weight and measurement? Fi muddina wa sa'ina. In those days when you purchased grain or barley or dates or anything, they would weigh it. You know, that's how they used to do it. And so the Prophet is saying, bless us in our units of measurement. What this means is, the food that you buy in Medina will be a blessed food. I.e., what does baraka mean? Ziyadatul khair. Baraka means it'll suffice more people. And so the food that you purchase in Medina by the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, it will suffice uh, more people. And our Prophet ﷺ, and, and by the way, this hadith has been interpreted. Uh, so uh, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma ja'al fi Medina ta fay ma ja'al fi Makkah min baraka. Oh Allah, make Medina double the blessings you have given to Makkah. Now, this hadith has proven a little bit problematic for some scholars because does this mean that Medina is more blessed than Makkah? Because that's what the dua is being said. And uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion. Some of the classical scholars of them is like Imam Malik because he was Madani, so he's a little bit biased towards his own hometown. Uh, they would consider Medina to be the holiest land, even if Makkah has more reward for praying. Because Mecca prayer has 100,000, whereas Medina prayer has 1,000, not 50, 1,000. Medina prayer has 1,000. Uh, and so clearly there's that difference. But for Imam Malik and others, they said the city of Medina has more blessings because of this hadith. And other scholars have said that each city is blessed in its own way. We don't compare the two. No doubt Mecca has superiority in some angles. Of them is that Mecca was blessed... Uh, some say from when the creation was created and then Ibrahim announced its blessing. This is the majority opinion. That Makkah was blessed the day Allah created the heavens and earth. And then Ibrahim announced its blessedness. Whereas Medina became blessed with the emigration of the Prophet to it. Right? So that's clearly a superiority for Mecca. Another, another superiority of Mecca is Mecca is the first masjid on earth. The first mosque or temple or structure meant to worship Allah on this whole earth. The first mosque was Mecca. That's a blessing. Of the blessings is that Mecca has 100,000 and Medina has 1,000. So it's not appropriate to compare. Each one has its fadila and its blessings. And this is something that we experience when we go there. Of the blessings of Medina, our Prophet ﷺ said that Iman returns to Medina like a desert animal returns to its hole in the desert. Al-Iman ya'ziru ila al-Madina. Al-Iman rushes back and, and, and goes in. And it's a beautiful analogy. When the desert animal feels threatened, when there's anything attacking it, immediately disappears and jumps into its hole. Right? So subhanAllah, when the people of Iman are attacked, or when Islam is facing a crisis, Medina will be the place where Iman will be protected. Medina will be the bastion of Islam. 
and uh, this is proven as well that Dajjal will never uh, enter it. Uh, of them is that Medina will be protected by pl uh, against the plots of its enemies. The Prophet ﷺ said, again, all of these hadith are Bukhari, subhanAllah, the blessings of Medina are so authentic, we find them in Bukhari and Muslim, that no one shall plot to harm Medina except that Allah will dissolve him like salt is dissolved in water. Like salt is dissolved in water, he will be disappeared. And in the same uh, book, Sahih Bukhari, he says that whoever uh, man ahdatha fiha hadathan, whoever, uh, it's, uh, what the meaning of hadath here is either a sin or an innovation. Whoever does a crime in Medina, whoever innovates something in Medina, or helps a criminal in Medina, he shall have the la'na of Allah and the la'na of the angels and the la'na of all of mankind. And Allah will not accept from him any obligatory or nafil deed. Nothing will be accepted of him. This is a huge blessing of Medina and at the same time a very dangerous warning for anybody who wishes to harm uh, Medina. And of the blessings of Medina is that it is a blessed place to live in. It is a blessed place to live in. The Prophet ﷺ said, again hadith is Bukhari, Al-Madinatu khayru lahum law kanu ya'lamun. Al-Madinatu khayru lahum law kanu ya'lamun. Medina is better for them if they only knew. Better for anybody if they only knew. No one leaves it. Not wanting to live there, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace him with someone better than that. No one leaves Medina not wanting to live there except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces him with someone better than that. And no one is patient at the difficulties of Medina. Medina is a very difficult land to live in because it's very hot, uh, because of its extreme hot and cold. By the way, both of them are present in Medina. Also, before the advent of modern technology, uh, food was also the seasonal. It was seasonal. When you don't have the, the date season, it's difficult. Uh, so there's some problems that were in Medina. So the Prophet said, whoever is patient, at the difficulties of Medina, I will be an intercessor for him on the day of judgment. And in fact, Medina is not just blessed to live in, it is blessed to die in as well. Hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, the Prophet said, Man istata'a minkum an yamut fil madinata fal yamut. Whoever amongst you is able to die in Medina, let him die in Medina because I shall intercede on behalf of anybody who dies there. Allahumma inna nusaluka al mawta fi madinati Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa dafna fi baqi al gharqad. Dying in Medina is a very big blessing in and of itself. And our Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is able to die in Medina, let him uh, do so. And we all know that Umar ibn al-Khattab, this hadith is in Bukhari, Umar ibn al-Khattab would make a strange dua, and his own son Ibn Umar would uh, scoff him and say, my father, how can this ever be true? Umar ibn al-Khattab would say, oh Allah, I want to die a shaheed, and I want to die in Medina. And his son would say that, oh my father, how can you combine these two things? If you want to die a shaheed, you're going to have to go to the borders of the Muslim empire. Right? And if you would die in Medina, you're not going to die a shaheed. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal accepted that dua because Umar died a shaheed in Medina. Right? And so Umar didn't want to leave Medina and he wanted to die a shaheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gave him that. And of course, Baqi al Gharqad especially has a very particular blessing, the, uh, what we call in our culture Jannat al Baqi'ah. The proper name is Baqi al Gharqad. Uh, Baqi al Gharqad has a very blessed, it is the most blessed graveyard in the world because. Uh, Ibn Hajar says that over 10,000 Sahaba are buried in Baqi al Gharqad. Over 10,000 Sahaba are buried in Baqi al Gharqad. All the nine wives of the Prophet, ﷺ, other than Khadija, all the nine wives of the Prophet ﷺ are buried in Baqi al Gharqad. The Prophet's son, Ibrahim, is buried in Baqi al Gharqad. The Prophet's great grandson and great great grandson and great 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 grandson are buried in Baqi al Gharqad. The Prophet's aunt, uh, Safiya, is buried in Baqi al Gharqad. Uh, so many of the close companions. Companions. Uthman ibn Affan is buried in Baqi al Gharqad. As you know, Bakr and Umar are buried in the Hijr along with the Prophet, and Uthman ibn Affan is buried in Baqi al Gharqad. Uh, also, uh, of the famous Tabi'un and Taba Tabi'un and scholars, Imam Malik and Imam Nafi', these are famous names, they're all buried in Baqi al Gharqad. And the Prophet made a special dua for the people of Baqi al Gharqad. And in one evening, when Aisha woke up and found that he wasn't there, he comes back and he tells her, Jibreel came to me in the middle of the night and told me to go and pray for the people in Baqi al Gharqad. And so he left his bed in the middle of the night to go to Baqi al Gharqad to pray for the people in Baqi al Gharqad. 
From a uh, fiqh perspective, from a fiqh perspective, Medina is something we call a haram. And this is something we need to talk a little bit about because we need to understand what exactly is a haram. Haram comes from haram, and haram means forbidden. Haram is an area of land that certain things which are halal outside of it become haram inside of it. That's why it's called a haram. That's why the root is the same. Certain things that are halal outside of the haram become haram inside of the haram. For example, carrying weapons is haram in the haram. You cannot carry weapons except for a necessity for the ummah. For example, the armed guards that are protecting the imams and what well, this is an exception, right? But armies do not come in. Even the Prophet says when he conquered Mecca, said Allah has given me special permission, suwayatin min al nahar, for a little bit of time in the day to come in with an army. Otherwise, it is not allowed to enter and march into Mecca with an army. It is not allowed to uh, to instigate any type of bloodshed in Mecca. Is not allowed to pluck the leaves and the fruits of Mecca. Is not allowed. It's such a haram that you cannot even pluck the grass that you see. That that much of a haram, right? It's so sacred. Any living object is protected. <coughs> That's how even a, a leaf, even a even a, 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 a leaf on the tree, you cannot pluck it. This is a haram, and a haram means everything is safe. And Allah says in the Quran, "Woman dakhalahu kana amina." Whoever enters the haram shall be safe. And therefore, Ibn Abbas uh, says, Ibn Umar says that in in the days of Jahiliyyah, a man would see. The murderer of his father doing tawaf around the Kaaba, and he wouldn't do anything to harm him. This is even in the days of Jahiliyyah. Qatilu Abi he would see, but he wouldn't harm him. Why? Because Mecca was a haram from Ibrahim's time. And so the Arabs knew it is a haram, and Islam came and affirmed that. A haram means everyone is protected there. And therefore, if you find a lost object in the haram, for example, you're not allowed to pick it up. You're not allowed to do that. Whereas you are allowed to pick it up in other places and then advert In Mecca, you leave it. You leave it. You're not even allowed to pick up a lost item. All of this is haram. It's the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever intends any harm in the haram, his punishment will be manifold. Allah says, whoever desires to cause fasad and harm, whoever desires it, forget doing it. If you desire to cause harm to the harams, Allah says, I'm going to cause you to punish a severe penalty. And so, the harams of our religion, now pay attention, I don't want people to get angry at this because it's going to cause a little bit of an issue now. So listen carefully. There are only two harams of our religion. Mecca and Medina. There are only two harams. al haramain al-Sharifain. Mecca and Medina. Now, Everybody's going to say, hold on a sec, how about Baytul Maqdis? How about Aqsa? The response, it is a blessed land. And it is the first Qibla. And it is something that we should visit and pray in. And whoever prays there gets extra reward, according to the most authentic narration, 250 times. So Mecca is 100,000, Medina is 1,000, Masjid Al-Aqsa, 250. And all of these blessings are there, but it is not a haram. From a fiqh standpoint, it's not a haram. Even if the people call it al-haram al-sharif. The people of Jerusalem call that area al-haram al-sharif, right? The, the Palestinians know this, right? It is known in the popular vernacular as al-haram. But from a fiqh standpoint, it is not al-haram. Because... These rulings don't apply over there. You may hunt the animals of Jerusalem. You cannot hunt the animals of Mecca and Medina. right? You may pluck the trees of Jerusalem. You cannot pluck the trees of Mecca and Medina. And by the way, this is not something I'm saying. None of our scholars, none of the madhahib, none of the ulama ever said that Jerusalem is a haram. It is Ard al-Muqaddas. It is a blessed land. So don't get confused between blessings and haram. Every haram is blessed, but there's only two harams, Mecca and Medina. But not every blessed place is a haram, right? And Jerusalem is the best example for this. The Jer Jerusalem is blessed, but it is not a haram. So this is something about Medina. Another three, four minutes about why Medina was chosen. And then inshallah, next week we'll start from 
the Prophet ﷺ entering Medina. Why, why, why was Medina chosen? Now obviously when we answer this question, we need to put the disclaimer, this is from what we understand and Allah knows the real reasons, if they are more or less than this. This is what our scholars have derived. And in reality, Allah knows there might be many reasons we'll never understand and figure out. Of those reasons, the most obvious reason, it's strategic location. It is reasonably close to Mecca without being too close. It's not too far and too close, right? From Mecca to Medina, an average caravan would take seven to eight days. And a very fast rider could do it in three, three and a half days, right? So from, that stand, from those standards, this is a distance that is not threateningly close. An army could not just surprise you. Right? But it's also not on the other side of the world, such as, let's say, in Abyssinia. You see the point here, is that it's a reasonable distance from the center of where the da'wah began, and that is Mecca. The, the place where that needs to be conquered in order to subdue all of Arabia. Also, so basically the strategic location, the central locality of the Arabian Peninsula, of the Hijaz, Medina is right dead in the middle of the Hijaz. And Hijaz in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula. So it's very strategic. Also, another reason is the natural protection of Medina. And this is clearly manifested in the Battle of the Trench. Medina is an amazing city from a military standpoint. How so? Ibn Ishaq points out that it is protected from three sides naturally. An army cannot attack it from three sides naturally. On the two sides, south and, uh, sorry, east and west, East and West, Al-Harra Sharqiya and Al-Harra Gharbiya. And they're still called exactly to this day, Harra Sharqiya and Harra Gharbiya. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that al Medina to Haramun Bayna Labbatayha. That Medina is a haram between its two Labba, a Harra. Labba, we said a few weeks ago, is lava. Labba is lava. And Labbatayha, it's two lava foundations. And Medina, there was uh, a volcanic activity maybe a few thousand years ago, Allah knows when. And so this volcanic activity spread outside the city of Medina and formed a type of material that is neither sand nor rock nor gravel. It's very, you don't, you under, you've seen uh, volcanic rock, semi-porous, up and down. It's not something you can walk on easily. So two areas of Medina, the, the east and the west, are surrounded by these large lab, harra. And the Prophet ﷺ said, between these two is the haram of Medina. So no army can walk in because you cannot walk with a thousand, two thousand people. You cannot ride camels on this area. It's just naturally protected. A third side of Medina, and this is the uh, southern side, which is the side closest to Mecca when you come. The southern side of Medina is generally a very luscious cultivation of date palms. And it was densely populated with date palms. And you cannot take an army through all of these date palms either. It's not going to be possible. You know, one person can wander through, but you can't bring an army through this, this dense cultivation and small little plantations everywhere. So there's only one area, one stretch of land left. And it was that stretch that the Prophet ﷺ had to protect when he dug the, the trench, right? The Ahzab, the Khandaq. That's the, the khandaq that he dug, it was a few miles long. So subhanAllah, this natural military strategic location, it actually <coughs> clearly was a divine wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was used in, that was used in the battle of the khandaq. Had it been any other city, this would not have been possible. You can't dig a, a moat around the entire city in a week. But they're able to dig a moat a few miles long. That's all that was the open area that an army could attack in, and they successfully uh, did this. Another uh, benefit of Medina was that the people of Medina had never been conquered before. They had always been an independent principality. And this gave them a sense of izza and a fighting spirit. Because when a nation has been conquered, generally their spirit has been broken. And it is easy to reconquer and reconquer and reconquer. But the people of Medina had never been subservient to any other fiefdom, any other uh, tribe. They had always been independent from its inception. And so they had this independence that was necessary for the beginning of Islam. They had an izzah that was necessary to translate into the early portion of Islam. Uh, also, Aisha points out one of the blessings of Medina was the wars of Bu'ath. 
The civil war that took place, we mentioned this many times before, the civil war that took place, uh, some scholars say it had been going on for a hundred years before the Hijrah, uh, and some say 40, 50 years, we never know exactly, but more than a generation of civil war. More than a generation of fighting, right? Uh, and this fighting had done many things. Aisha says this was a gift that Allah gave to the Prophet as I said before, it was a gift coming out of nowhere because the people of Mecca are not monitoring the wars of Bu'ath. But Allah has a plan. And when everything finishes, you can connect the dots. But when the dots are being drawn out, we don't know what's happening. The wars of Bu'ath did many things. Most importantly, it eliminated the senior leadership of the city. The leadership that's the older generation, the power hungry, the ones stubborn in their ways, and it gave fresh blood a chance to come up. And fresh blood, many things happen with younger blood. They're open-minded. They're not as stuck in the old traditional ways. They're willing to experiment with other ideas, other religions such as Islam. They're also uh, tired of the bloodshed. They're just tired of having been raised in a whole generation of blood. Everybody's died, their fathers, their uncles, their grandfathers, all. So they want change, they're embracing change. And so they want a new leader from outside of the bloodied tribes, because everybody else is going to be tainted, right? They're wanting a fresh, neutral leader, and they found this in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, this is, as she said, gift to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the miracles that Allah Azza wa Jal chose Medina for, and this is clearly a divine wisdom, that SubhanAllah, out of all of the tribes of Arabia, out of all of the places in the peninsula, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a direct blood connection with the people of Medina. Clearly this is willed by Allah. And he had no blood connection with the people of Habasha. He had no blood connection with the people of Yemen, with the people of the, the Najd. There's no connection. But Allah chooses his place of immigration to a land that he is actually related to. In fact, he is a second cousin of some of them. Second cousin is not that far off, right? Second cousin is not that far off. How so? Go back to one of the early lectures that we gave. And uh, we talked about the Prophet's great-grandfather, Hashim. The Banu Hashim, he is the Banu Hashim, right? The Prophet's great-grandfather was Hashim. And Hashim was a trader, a traveler, and he would go through Medina on his way to Syria. And one time when he went through Yathrib, of course it was called Yathrib at the time, he saw a very energetic, dynamic, beautiful lady called Salma, who was a business lady. And she was a very strong personality lady as well. In fact, it is said she would marry and divorce men of her choice, not the other way around, right? That's how strong personality she was. And she was the daughter of the chieftain, so that gave her that independence. She was the daughter of the chieftain. And so, uh, when he was in the marketplace, he was attracted to this lady. And he found out that she's single, she's been divorced a number of times, she's now single, so he sends a proposal through her father, she lays a condition down, because she, she is the, mashallah, that type of lady. She's like, I'm going to stay here, and any children we have are going to be with me, and I'm not going to give any of my business uh, entrepreneurship up. I'm still going to remain who I am. Right? I'm going to be who I am. I'm not going to become a housewife. I'm going to become a... I'm going to remain a business lady. Right? And so Hashim agreed to this. And it is said that he, they were only able to be together for a short period of time uh, because then he died in... Actually, he died in Gaza, believe it or not, in Palestine. He died in Gaza. Uh, of course, but at that time, Gaza was Roman Empire. He was traveling and trading over there. So... Uh, Salma is pregnant with his son and she didn't tell the Quraysh that she's pregnant because she wants to keep the child. The son is born, he has a white streak on his head so he, call, he is called Shayba. He is called Shayba. And he grows up and the Quraysh have no idea that there's a son that belongs to them because she didn't tell. She's again independent minded. Finally when somebody finds out they're going through and they look at this guy and this, this is not, his features are all Qurashi. His features are all, and they can tell this, right? So he asks this, this boy, who is your father? And the father, of course he knows who his father is. He's proud because his father is Hashim, the leader of the Quraysh, what not? So he said, my father is Hashim, you know, of the Quraysh. Instantaneously he goes back and tells the Quraysh, do you know, you have a, a son over there, you have somebody. So immediately, Al-Muttalib, the brother of Hashim, secretly goes in, finds the kid, and convinces him to come back with him. Basically, 
you can say it a type of kidnapping, but it's a voluntary kidnapping. Because he bribes the kid. That you're the son of a chieftain, you're going to come back, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You can't stay here and you know, give up a future. And the kid was probably 12, 13 years old at the time, Abdul Muttalib, of course, Shaiba. And so he is seduced by these uh, talk of grandeur and majesty, which would all come true, by the way. Which would all come true. And so Hashim, uh, uh, sorry, Al-Muttalib puts him on his, on his camel and quickly rides away without telling Salma because or else, as you know, what would have happened if the mother found out. So they go back to the Quraysh and when they enter, the Quraysh ask, who is this kid? Is he your slave that you purchased? And he doesn't want to say anything because he's worried about the news spreading back. So he remains quiet. So Shaiba is called Abd al-Muttalib. And who is Abd al-Muttalib? The grandfather of the Prophet <laughs> Is this not a divine miracle that the grandfather of the Prophet is raised in Yathrib? Right? The very streets, the very houses that the Prophet is going to be living in basically. Right? His grandfather has seen them and lived there. I mean, is this out of all the cities in Arabian Peninsula? Allah is planning. Yani Allah's plan is working through history. Right? There's no question about it. So Abdul Muttalib is raised in Medina until he's a teenager. And his relatives are still there. And of course, uh, uh, Salma is from the tribe of uh, the Banu Adi ibn Najjar, from the Khazraj, from the Khazraj. And therefore, the Prophet is a second cousin to the Khazraj. Because his grandfather, his grandfather's mother is a Khazraji. Right, his great-grandmother. His grandfather's mother. And you need to understand, the Arabs memorized their lineage inside out. They knew every ancestor for 20 generations. This was how they were. And the Prophet ﷺ to them was not a stranger. He was a second cousin. He was somebody related. Now, to be frank here, somebody related through a female is not the same as a male for that culture, and even in Islamic law, right? Nonetheless, it is a relation. So they considered it to be a akhwal, the relation through the mother. Right? Not like the Amam, which is a much stronger bond. But it's not as if, so this is why somebody might say, why would the Khazraj choose the Prophet when he's a stranger? Well, he's not quite a stranger. He is blood. In the end of the day, he is blood. And they know this. And in fact, when the Prophet did migrate to Medina, it's not a coincidence he stayed in the house of? Who did his house did he stay in? <laughs> Whose house did he stay in? <laughs> Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who is from the... Bani Adi ibn Najjar. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is his closest relative of the Ansar. It's not a coincidence. I mean, that's exactly the point. That he is staying in a relative's house. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is his uh, relative. Uh, also of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, again, we, uh, we can assume, and Allah knows best, uh, chose the city of Yathrib, was that the, the people of Yathrib, the people of Yathrib, the Arabs of Yathrib, uh, the Aus and the Khazraj, the Arabs of Yathrib were the Aus and the Khazraj, and they were descendants of Qahtan. And Qahtan, now go back all the way to my second lecture, of course everyone has remembered everything about the genealogies of the Arabs, and I don't need to quiz you, right? You all have completely memorized this, right? Uh, and so, let me actually quiz you, who were the two main progenitors of the Arabs? The MashaAllah, see, some of the sisters do remember, MashaAllah. And none of the brothers are any, it's a, you remember, MashaAllah. Okay, one brother also remembers, Alhamdulillah. Qahtan and Adnan, Qahtan and Adnan. Qahtan are the Yemeni Arabs and Adnan are the Hijazi Arabs. They're very simplistic, right? These were the two main tribes and there was still tension between them. There was still, you know, a little bit of civil issues and whatnot, you know, skirmishes. Now, again, it's not a coincidence, you know, clearly. Qahtani and Adnani are merging together to form the new Islamic State. SubhanAllah, out of all of the local tribes, they were all Adnani other than the Aus and the Khazraj. Again, it's not, Allah has plan. Allah has a plan that He is putting in place, right? The surrounding tribes of the Quraysh were all Adnani, except for the Aus and the Khazraj. They were Qahtani. And so, in the early Islamic state, for the Adnani and the Qahtanis to come together, nobody could oppose them on nationalistic grounds anymore. Nobody could oppose the Muslims on nationalistic ethnic grounds because they're both Adnan and Qahtan. And this is a sign of what's going to happen, that Islam will come to obliterate these ethnic differences. Islam will come to get rid of this uh, tribalism. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Qahtanis, um, the, uh, there's also benefits of this as well, and I mentioned this before, the Prophet ﷺ praised the people of Yemen. And Aus and Khazraj are Yemenite. 
And the Prophet said, Al Hikmatu Yamanin wal Imanu Yamaniya. Wisdom is Yemeni and Iman is Yemeni. Beautiful hadith. Al Hikmatu Yamanin wal Imanu Yamaniya. That the Yemeni people are good people. The Yemeni people are wise people. They're faithful people. They're loyal people. And wallahi, this is so true that our Yemeni brothers, mashallah, they really are humble, nice, gentle brothers. We all know this. And the Prophet praised them, you know, 14 centuries ago. And these are the Ansar. Because they are Yemeni in their blood. They are originally uh, Yemeni. Um, one final point, I know I'm getting a little bit late. We cannot really talk about this in detail. Uh, but the, the unique combination of the Yehud and the Arabs in Yathrib was very necessary as well. And it has, of course, some cons came out of it, as you know, of the presence of the Yehud. But there were also many benefits that came out as well. And of the greatest benefits, and we mentioned this two, three weeks ago, the Aus and the Khazraj had rubbed shoulders with a monotheistic people for two centuries. And they're familiar with the concept of prophets, the concept of a book, the concept of a Sharia. Ah. And the Yehud have always been flouting it in their face that we're better than you because we have all of these things. Right? And the table was flipped against them because this arrogance served to empower the Ansar, the Aus and the Khazraj to embrace the truth when they saw it. That they were flouting their arrogance and the Aus and the Khazraj realized that it does make sense to have a Sharia. Ah. It does make sense that Allah sends prophets. But as you know, that religion doesn't want converts, right? It's not, a, it's not a universal religion, it is a localized, it is an ethnic religion. So the Aus and Khazraj cannot convert to the faith. But they know the truths of the faith. For two centuries it's been being rubbed in their faces basically, right? And so when the truth comes, the people who are waiting for it reject it, and the people who weren't expecting it no, it's the truth and accept it. You understand this point, right? The Aus and the Khazraj therefore uh, accept it and the interactions uh, uh, of the Yehud as well have a lot of positives and also some negatives came out of it as well. We'll talk inshallah next week about uh, where did these uh, Jewish tribes come from. It's a very, very important question which uh, has many different theories. question is very interesting. In the middle of the Arabian Peninsula, where did these Jewish tribes come from? Who are they? What is their origin? What were they doing there? I mean, the centers of Judaism are, you know, uh, uh, the, the Babylon and, and uh, um, Jerusalem before the expulsion. After the expulsion, they go to so many different places. They were in Baghdad, in Iraq. What are they doing here in the center of the Arabian Peninsula? There are a number of theories out there. And we'll talk about them, inshallah, next week, along with the relationship of the Aus and Khazraj and the Yehud. And then we'll talk about the entering of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, into Medina and start the new phase, the Madani uh, phase. Uh, inshallah, we have a few minutes left for questions, so if there are any questions now, uh, we can take them, inshallah. May I ask a question? First hand, second hand, yes. Uh, the question is about what did Salman do when her son was taken away without her consent? It is uh, said that because uh, Shayba or Abdul Muttalib had now become a young man, there's nothing much she could do because remember, you're independent when you reach puberty and he had already reached puberty, right? And uh, he basically, now we don't know too much, but what we do know is that he reassured his mother that this is his choice, what can be done now? He's a man. No. Uh, Abdul Muttalib basically reassured his mother that this is now my choice now. I want to be here. Basically, right? Now when he's a young man, what are you going to do? Now this is just the reality of life. In our times when a 25-year-old wants to do something, what is the father going to do? You know, Some of us face this problem already, right? It's just the reality of life. So in those days, he's now a young man. He can make his choice. And he did make his choice and he remained where he was. Yes, Dr. Right, so I mean, we know from the Prophet's life that he knew about Kaaba as the eventual <laughs> look at this time. But it seems as far as Medina is concerned, he did not recognize that because Although his family came from Medina, he must have traveled to Medina on his expedition. He did travel to Medina, we said. as come to his mind when he was shown those date palm trees, so this is something... He was five years old when he went to Medina. He was five years old, and he only visited it once, perhaps for a few weeks. And again, why did Amina take him to Medina? To visit his second cousins, to visit the extended akhwal, because the Arabs did have this concept of family, extended family. So the only reason Amina traveled all the way to Yathrib is to allow the Prophet to see some of his you know, fellow 
you know, uh, second, third cousins, if you like. And then on the way back, Amina passed away. So when the Prophet was shown the city, he clearly did not recognize it. This is not then part of the Eid after Quraysh and Eid after Imre Lathir Shatai was safe because the Prophet was a traitor. No, Medina was not Eid after Imre Lathir Shatai was safe. Medina was a stopping point when they would go to Syria. Did he travel that route as a trader? That's what the question I'm asking. Did he travel this route as a trader? If you remember back when we talked about the incident of Buhaira, the monk, we said that it is very problematic and it is very likely that the Prophet never traveled as a trader. Right. So if the story is not authentic, the only time therefore he, he would have gone to Medina is when he was five years old. Okay. Question from the sisters. Yes, go ahead. So uh, obviously there are a number of exceptions. Of the exceptions is Al Abbas when the Prophet said uh, it is not allowed to pluck any leaves. Abbas said, Ya Rasulullah, make an exception for Al Idhir. Allow us this one tree at least. Al-Idhir because it has so many benefits and they use it for a number of things. So the Prophet said, Illa al-Idhir. Okay, we'll allow you to plug Idhir. Uh, also, the scholars say this does not apply to trees planted by humans for cultivation. This applies to natural trees. Right? So farmers are not prevented from plucking their crops. Again, I mean, I'm not giving the fiqh class, so I just glazed over these rules. Uh, farmers are not prevented from plucking their own uh, fruits because how else are you going to live? Right? But natural vegetation is protected. Also, when there is a need or a necessity to do it, then the scholars allow it to be done. So for example, the Prophet when he was building the mosque, he had to cut the date palms to build it. So anytime you need to construct something, there's a legitimate reason to do it. So this is considered to be a necessity in order to cut it off. So the point being that when there is a need, then you may carry weapons. So the guards of the Haram carry weapons. They have guns, you know, and for good reason they have guns because there have been attempts to, you know, do strange things in the Mecca. We want them to be protecting the Kaaba, you know. Uh, so they're allowed to carry weapons. This is an exception to the rule. Uh, so the same applies when you need to construct something that for legitimate reasons you may pluck, you may destroy the trees, you may cut it off. As I said, the Prophet himself had trees uh, cut off when he was building his own masjid, even though he calls Medina a Haram. So construction is a necessity that allows trees to be plucked. And other reasons as well. Yes? There is this tradition, at least in the Pakistani culture, that if you go visit Medina, you stay for eight days and pray 40 prayers. Is there any... Uh, there is a tradition that is close to being fabricated. It's one level above fabric. The question is uh, this notion of praying 40 prayers. Chalis namaze. Uh, for eight days. Uh, where does this come from? And the response is, there is a tradition reported in the Musnad of Al-Bazzar, which is a very obscure work, relatively speaking, meaning it's one of the more tertiary works of Hadith, and it is almost fabricated, if not fabricated, it is almost fabricated, and it mentions this tradition of uh, whoever prays 40 salawat with takbiratul ihram in Medina will be saved from nifaq. Having said this, uh, there's nothing wrong with praying 40 prayers in Medina. You know, it's very good. Uh, so, this is one of those things that we should be a little bit wise about. Uh, there's nothing from the Sunnah to stay for eight days and pray all 40 prayers. Uh, but if somebody is doing it, yeah, I mean, what are we going to say? I mean, you know, okay, alhamdulillah, he's in Medina doing this. But our scholars do point out that if you have uh, so many days to spend, do realize that a prayer in Mecca is worth a hundred thousand, whereas in Medina is one thousand. Our scholars have said this very clearly, that Mecca is a hundred thousand and Medina is one thousand. So the emphasis should be on Mecca for this reason. Uh, and visiting Medina is a very big blessing. And it's a very you know important thing. But it is not a rukun of our religion. Unlike Mecca, it is a pillar of our religion if you can afford to. Correct? Right? Visiting Mecca is a pillar if you're able to do it. You cannot do Hajj without visiting Mecca. Now we will say it is not proper that you go all the way to Mecca and then don't go to Medina. Nonetheless, if somebody were to do this, there's no sin. And there are people who can only, let's say, go for eight days for Hajj, six days for Hajj, right? 
There are people, many people like this. And if they can only get this package that, okay, we can only go from Mecca, do the five-day hajj and come back, they have done the fadil of hajj. We will all agree to this, right? Not very good that they didn't go to Medina, but there's no sin at the same time. So visiting Mecca is a pillar of our religion if we can afford it. And visiting Medina is very strongly encouraged and recommended. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, could you tell us uh, the hadood of the boundary of Haram in Mecca and Medina? The boundary of Mecca is more difficult, um, and it's something that, in fact, to be honest, both boundaries realize that geographical surveys are a modern phenomenon, right? And to have, you know, satellite maps or Google Earth where we draw a line so with such precision, it's a modern notion. In the time of the process, it was vague areas, right? And therefore, uh, even if you go for to do Hajj, for example, there is a sign that says Muzdalifa stops here, Mina begins here, right? And our scholars say that even if you're within visual sight of that sign, on the other side of the sign, this is something overlooked because these are generic regions, right? So if the sign is right here and then you're two feet away, it's not as if you're outside of Mina because this is a generic region. Right? Now if you're you know, half a mile away, oh no, that's not good. But if you're five, ten feet away, and that, uh, this, is not a, this is not a theoretical scenario. In Muzdalifa, for example, many times you try to find a place to sleep. You know this personally, maybe first time. I have many times this has happened. You don't find a place. And as soon as you get to the sign, it's dead empty. Right? There is no sin at all for you to sit right outside the sign, and the sign is right here, and you're sitting here. Not at all, because the process didn't draw a line in the sand. You see my point here, right? So that's one point. The same applies for the haram. So the, uh, the, the Madani haram is demarcated clearly, more clearly than the Makki haram. And the Madani haram, the Prophet said, Al Madina to haramun ma bayna ayrin ila thawr. And another hadith, Fahu uh, haramun bayna la bateha. So la bateha means the two volcanic plains of east and west. And ayr and thawr are north and south, small mountains. And Ayr is a mountain behind Uhud, and Thawr is a mountain on the other side, small mountains. So the Prophet clearly demarcated four points, the two Labbas, east and west, and Ayr and Thawr, north and south, right? And so from this, modern scholars, in fact, there was a survey done in the previous generation amongst my teachers in Medina uh, in the 19... <coughs> 70s, in the 1970s, and I read their survey myself uh, when I was in Medina, uh, they did a survey where they tried to form a type of more precise boundary, and they have, they have their conclusion, which is then the official Saudi government position now, uh, based on this. But again, imagine the process and gave you four points. How are you going to connect the dots, right? So there is an element of vagueness, and then there is, uh, you have a general limit. So behind Uhud is not Medina. From Uhud to the Haram is Medina. Between the two plains is Medina, like this. Okay. Uh, follow up question regarding praying in, in Mecca. If you say one mile away praying from the uh, from the Kaaba, you know, in the Masjid, yes. one mile away, would it be getting <laughs> the You are asking very deep questions. You don't realize the profundity of them, I think. Very well, this is the final question. This is a deep question. Medina, so let's start with Medina. Medina, uh, in Medina, the reward of a thousand prayers is restricted to the masjid. The reward of a thousand is restricted to the masjid, not the rawda. A lot of people think only the rawda has a thousand. No, the entire masjid will be a thousand. Right? And if the masjid is expanded beyond what it is now, it will be in that expansion. When Umar, who the first person to expand the masjid was Umar ibn Khattab. And he saw some people hesitate to pray in the extension. He saw some people hesitate to pray in the extension. And he said, Wallahi, it will be the masjid even if it goes to uh, Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa is the Miqat. If I expand it, that is the masjid. So from this, the scholars say, whatever is the physical masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, at, the, at any current time, that will be the thousand reward. So if you pray in the furthermost corner of the masjid, you will get a thousand. And if you pray in Saf al-Awwal, you will get a thousand. But you will get more for being in Saf al-Awwal, but the thousand will be the same. Correct? Rawda has blessings separate from this. Now, 
Your question about Mecca is a profound one. Why? Because there is a classical ikhtilaf from the time of the Sahaba regarding what does it mean to say Al-Haram Al-Makki? Does it mean the Masjid only? Or does it mean the Haram, i.e. the Haram Haram? Right? Do you understand this point? The Fiqhi Haram. Right? Within, within the boundaries. Yeah, within the boundaries. Right? This is an ikhtilaf that goes back to the Tabi'un Taba Tabi'un. Goes back to the earliest of times. And they both have their evidences. They both have their evidences. So for example, we just talked about Isra wal Mi'raj, right? Sahih Bukhari tells us that the Prophet ﷺ was in his house. Was in his house. His house was outside the masjid. Correct? Allah says in the Quran, Subhan al asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram. Ila al masjid al aqsa. So Allah called his house masjid al haram. And that's one of the evidence that the, it's not really a majority, it's a 50-50 split maybe. One of the evidences that is used to say that all of Mecca is the blessed haram. And it's not just the masjid around the Kaaba. Right, that's one opinion. And another opinion is that no, it is the masjid and the congregation of the masjid. Right, and to be honest, I lived there for 10 years and I was not able to find an opinion that made sense to me. Both have very strong evidences, but alhamdulillah, when I went to Mecca, I always prayed in the haram, so I never had to worry about this issue. It's like, you know, who would go to Mecca and then go a mile away to pray? You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. in the Hajj time, if the congregation is connected to the hotel places, then it will count as the congregation of the Kaaba. So we don't have to worry about this. We're asking about the other masajid in Mecca. Will you get the 100,000 reward or not? And many scholars say, yes, all of the haram of Mecca is the, the 100,000. And many say it is only that masjid. But for us, alhamdulillah, when we go there, we don't have to worry about this. The people of Mecca can debate, and of course, they prefer the other opinion, obviously. right? But for us, we don't have to worry about this, because we always pray, inshallah, in the, uh, the center haram, which is the, the haram masjid. Inshallah, we will continue uh, next Wednesday. Any announcements, Danish? <laughs> The what? One final question. Go ahead, Bismillah. Uh, you were told that the Sussa is not being a very good brave to pray. So, what prayer we should do for the deceased if somebody goes to cover um, the grave? The Prophet's dua to, uh, in front of the graves was very authentically reported. Assalamu alaikum ya ahla qawmi min al-muslimin wa al-mu'minin wa inna insha'Allah bikum lahiqoon nasallallahu lana wa lakum al-afiyya and other du'as are mentioned the Prophet sallallahu du'as are numerous in front of the grave uh, and we mentioned before two weeks ago was it about the issue of reading Quran and whatnot it has never been narrated that the Prophet sallallahu would read Fatiha in front of the grave or do anything like this so we should stick to the sunnah it is better and uh, make the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Inshallah with this we will conclude and continue next Wednesday Inshallah. Bismillah.